here good morning everybody we are back home from what was a, clearly a wonderful dive in the river at Elvis really excited by the objects that we found this morning and um, brought them all outside and um, take advantage of this late spring sunshine We've got the small objects there we'll go through them separately We've got a little pile of uh, casting waste um, which I've separated out into a different bag so not to damage the smaller finds. Got some wonderful footage of on our GoPro, a nice cup of coffee to warm me up. And a cat, a cat has come into the shot. Hi Bo. Anyway, so um, right, let's go, let's press on. We have some objects here, the large ones that's uh, an iron object. Not 100% sure what this is, maybe some pincers or some sort of tongs. Might have had a little loop there which it could have been suspended of on. Not 100% sure what that might be. So we'll um, perhaps associate it with Durham's medieval um, craft guilds. This is a spoon that we caught we found on camera. Uh, this is Waterloo Hotel Durham, fantastic. So this is a soup spoon or dessert spoon. From the Water, Waterloo Hotel in Durham, uh, probably date that one, Walker and Hall, Sheffield, little pennant on there. So um, the Waterloo Hotel was actually where, um, it's knocked down now, it was knocked down in the early 1970s to make way for the, the new Elford Bridge and it's literally a stone's throw away from where, where we found this one so it's wonderful evidence of that, um, that hotel which was probably there for a hundred years or so. The, the hotel was actually where the Swan and Three Signets and um, the Royal County Hotel is. Obviously it's a road there now. These are just two shards of ceramic uh, or pottery. And you just make out that one would have come from a vessel sort of circular there. You can just make out a nice little bowl. Um, and that one there is a lovely little rim, perhaps of a jug. So it's quite a narrow little entrance there. So perhaps um, from the same vessel, they were found quite close together. Um, this is what we call green glazeware. It's very common, uh, commonly found in Durham, well, Durham City. Um, Professor Martin Carver found a lot of this um, in the 1970s when he excavated the adjacent uh, old tenements. So lovely uh, late medieval 14th, 15th, 16th century green glazeware. This particular object is a, a, a clear pipe bowl. Just see, you wouldn't have gotten a lot of tobacco in there. Not, not much at all. Um, normally you'd have a maker's mark in there, but this is plain. So given the very small size of this bowl, this is perhaps a late, mid to late 16th century, right at the early development of tobacco. You couldn't afford very much. Um, so it's a wonderful evidence from that time. The casting waste, this is very, very common for Durham. It's just typically lead casting waste. Uh, evidence that smelting the manufacture of lead goods was taking place in riverside workshops adjacent to the river. So before I tip out the small finds, I just wanna talk about this object here because I am so excited by this one. So given that we are looking for some objects to research, um, fully research, publish the material, um, and if possible get into a museum exhibition, this is probably the star find. It is absolutely lovely. What you're looking at is a um, very small cross pendant. So it's, uh, it's got equal length flaring arms. Uh, four little recesses in the center there. Strangely, it's got terminals uh, at the end of each arm there. And on, uh, you just hopefully you can just make out that detail there, is this series of small raised pellets one, two, three, four, five, six. And I wonder if that is sort of stylized Anglo-Saxon garnets, um, garnet cell work. You know, during the seventh century, those beautiful crosses, as St. Cuthbert's is, um, golden cloisonnier, small cells of garnets cut down and put in. So potentially this is a stylized form of those, those garnets. I've never seen one of this form. Maybe, just maybe, this little quatrefoil, quatrefoil recess in the centre housed some little gems. Maybe some glass, uh, red glass, I would have guessed, before it was made. 
So it's plain on the reverse, you can just see the four holes coming through. You can see more clearly these little terminals at the end of the flaring arms. Uh, and it looks a little bit damaged just there, it might be missing the loop. So I wonder if it had a bit of a loop on the top, which would have um, allowed it to be suspended around the neck. Um, the only other observation that, observation that I make is that these little, these are, so, excuse me, these are more concaved um, sections at the end, edge, edges of the arms. Cuthbert's cross was sort of convex, it came out over. So it's an unusual form, almost as if it was a Byzantine cross. But this is an incredibly rare find for Durham. It's evidence of pilgrimage, well, so, well certainly a symbol, a Christian symbol, evidence of pilgrimage to the shrine of Cuthbert perhaps. Again, it hints at the, strengthens this uh, theory of the deliberate disposition into a watery context um, by a pilgrim. So if you come on um, pilgrimage to the shrine of Cuthbert, did you buy this? Is this something you would buy? Absolutely beautiful little object and without a shadow of doubt, this will be on display in the Museum of Archaeology and Palace Green Library or perhaps even uh, the Open Treasures exhibition at Durham Cathedral. So get that one cleaned up, we'll do some metallurgical analysis in the lab, some EDXRF and work out. It looks like a pewter but probably a high tin content on this particular one. So was it a eutechnic quality pewter? So a lead tin mix, absolutely beautiful, incredibly rare and I'm going to date that given its style, given its the manufacturing techniques um, to that late medieval period, the 14th, 15th, maybe early 16th century. Absolutely delighted with that one. Okay, right, let's tip these out. Oh, before I do, I'll just lift this one out. There's a lovely little toy wheel. Uh, I'm guessing of a child's toy. This particular one has to be off uh, a train. So lovely clear spokes there, nice little brass boss in the in the middle. You just imagine a young boy being gutted when he lost his, his toy train in the river. Just gonna check these out. So this river water doesn't run down. Okay, so this is typical, a typical group of finds from the river where you at Elvet small metal objects in the everyday material culture of the citizens of Durham for the last 800 years and um, very rarely do, does anything predate the bridge um, and all of these being metal they sink very qu quickly to the bottom um, and perhaps that's why they've been preserved so we've got you know material culture evidence of you know activity at Elvet uh, activity on the bridge uh, um, activity in riverside workshops uh, houses would have been position close by or tenements um, and the rubbish just literally thrown in so if something was broken it was thrown in where do we start where do we start right there's a nice little thimble there a copper alloy thimble a twisted wire loop so there's a copper alloy thimble a little bit crushed it's got some dimples in around it's quite large so that would have fitted on the end of a finger of perhaps an adult we do get much smaller ones evidence of you know sewing a nice little object that's probably 17th or 18th century that one there's a cloth seal there's I knew I know I got a couple of cloth seals I'm just gonna put them to one side uh, oh, there's a lovely buckle there another buckle but we'll talk about them in a moment is there any more buckles there's another cloth seal part of one yeah I knew I'd, I knew I'd had some buckles right these little buckles are circular or annular shoe buckles dated to the 12th between the 12th and 14th century these are all pewter uh, and the vast majority are undecorated but that little beauty there has a lovely little beaded border around the outside you can just make up that detail there it's incredibly rare to find them decorated like this and um, they all typically have an iron pin in there and you can actually see there's a constriction there where the pin would have been wonderful evidence of you know dress accessories from that late medieval period in Durham probably takes a total to over 500 for the buckles that we found so far and um, oh, that was a nice little button I'm sure I'll find a couple of buttons 
Ah, oh, there's another one. <coughs> so, let's grab a cup of tea. So, two buttons there. Um, oh, look at that. Look at the detail on that. First of all, this one's a very small uh, round buckle, lovely smooth head with a twisted wire loop on there. So, uh, quite functional, flat back on it there. I would date that to the 18th, late 17th, early 18th century, that one. In itself, that's really nice. However, this one is incredible. This is a much earlier. This is probably late medieval, or uh, early post medieval button it's quite heavy so it's almost lead so it must be a pewter button but the lead contents probably high and it has an integral loop in there so it's discoidal in shape and there's a lovely little casting flashing across the back so we can tell it was made in a two-part mold but on the front is some absolutely beautiful decoration it's a letter um, that has to be a B or it could be an R, capital R, more likely a B. There's a little hash, hash decoration there, stride, um, striations in there. So that's a lovely little button. Um, incredibly rare to find one with decoration like that. You can just imagine, was that commissioned by somebody? Make me some buttons with my initial on, my surname initial. Absolutely beautiful button. Enhance our collection. Just touch on that one, that's a lovely little lead, uh, sorry, copper alloy casting waste again it just strengthens this metal working theory and um, but obviously in this case casting waste they're using copper so that's that's absolutely fantastic important information um, oh that's a lump of lead and I recognize from the form this little recess around the outside it's actually a pot mend so if you had a vessel that had a hole in um, you would pour a little lump of lead in and it would seal up the, the, the ceramic and that's what you can see around the outside there. So I'll get that little thinner one there. Why you'd choose to put lead in a, a vessel, obviously it's dangerous, it's not we not something that we would do now, but it prolonged the length the, the time of the use of the uh, the vessel. So we've got uh, I like these, these are little curtain hooks. That's my theory. Of what they are little brass hooks uh, quite often these are crudely made you can see where they're being filed down I can't really think of any other purpose for them I've got around about 50 of these um, and I've classified them as curtain hooks so they're nice there's a little object there that might be a tool of some form sort of it goes to a point there it's got a little spike on the end did that have a wooden handle so in which case what would that have perp what would its purpose have been? Maybe leather working tool. Uh, another carpet um, stair rod holder. So you had a carpet rod through there. And um, pins and buckles. Uh, nuts, mounts, decorative mounts. Uh, uh, perhaps these are uh, coffin fittings used to decorate coffins, that particular type. Okay, so what I want to do now, rather than go in, there's another button. Uh, pins. Can you make out all of the pins? Pins are absolutely prolific in the river. Take out, take out the nails. So we've got a wide selection of pins. Typically I'll find um, over 100 pins on every single dive. And oh, there's a nice little object. That's a, a lace chip. So I'll talk about the pins first. So these are all brass pins, uh, wire drawn brass pins with a twisted wire head. That form there is much, clearly much larger than these little delicate ones. So um, perhaps that's slightly older, 17th century. So if we use Capel's typology, we can probably date these to the 18th century, these particular ones. Um, quite often you get quite crude twisted wire heads on the top. So again, uh, more valuable evidence of either using these decorated ones, chunky ones, in a lady's headdress, use perhaps about 20 pieces in a woman's headdress, or were drapers and tailors using them uh, to manufacture 
um, clothing. There's another little button there just found. Um, there's another button. There's three buttons with the loops missing. Uh, oh, there's a nice little buckle. That's a nice buckle, that one. Is that a trapezoid, tra trapezoid shape? Not sure. We've had an iron pin going through the centre. That one's 16th, 17th century in date. Uh, right, uh, twisted wire loops, pins, maybe the spoon handle is a strange device. <laughs> it looks like a needle with this flattened head and eye, eye hole there, but this is lead, so completely useless as a needle because it's always going to bend, uh, but it looks like a needle. So <laughs> not sure what that one is. Right, some nails. Okay, so what else? Oh, there's a lead lead trade token, uh, cross and pellet type. So four little pellets on each side, uh, very thin. Uh, and I'm guessing that is one as well. Yeah, that particular one's got uh, some stars on. One, two, three, four, five stars. What looks like a letter D. So lead trade tokens, uh, there was a shortage of coinage in England. Um, and if you were a merchant, um, a, a butcher, a baker, a candlestick, maker you would make your own lead tokens and you could exchange them for goods in your shop um, there's a, a broken needle evidence of metal working uh, needle working so the points probably snapped off there nice little eyelet there brass needle again evidence of you know everyday material culture oh here's our little lace chip so uh, and I know it's a lace chip because it's got a lovely little hole there so somewhere around there there'll be a little line where, where it's being rolled together. So this lace chip would have been attached to the end of a thin piece of cord or lace um, and used to thread it through eyelets. So lovely to find lace chips, I do like finding them. That's a strange object, I'm not 100% sure what these are but I've found several of them uh, over the years. Um, sort of decorative in a way but I've got no idea what it is. This one's quite badly damaged, but absolutely no idea what that one is. Yeah, there's a spindle wall, another spindle wall. Found about 50 of these. This one's smooth, undecorated. The hole's got some concretion in. You would have had the spindle going through it. Um, and the faster you spun it, the heavier the, the, the weight was, the faster the yarn was spun. Um, it made it more tighter. So used in conjunction with the distaff. Um, Button. Right, so what I want to do is just talk about these cloth seals now, I'll finish off on these. So, start with this one first, this is a four part lead cloth seal. Um, it's really smooth, so it's worn, so it's not going to tell us a great deal. But given its form, this I know this is a 17th, early 18th century four part lead cloth seal. So that's part one, that disc. Part two, there's a thin interconnecting strip. There's part three, which has some letters on, an S and a V perhaps there. Um, and there's part four, the fourth uh, disc. And that lump there is the rivet that was once attached to disc one and it was pushed through a little circular hole. And when this was folded over the edge of cloth and flattened down, it sealed it to the cloth. And what I can see in there is almost certainly woolen cloth. And we'll be able to analyze that if we wanted to um, and calculate its, uh, the warp and the weft, the, the thread count, um, what type of fibre was being used, almost certainly wool, and um, we can even do some ultra high performance liquid chromatography on that and find out if it would be dyed as well. So that's a four part lead cloth seal. This is a crude two part one that's badly worn, all of the outer edges of. So on one side it has the initials R and perhaps an S there and on the reverse are some little crosses one two terminal there for a third one so three very small crosses it's a two-part cloth seal badly worn 17th century in date but this one here I'm really excited by just just wet it with some of this river water just to bring up the detail so what you're looking at here is a complete uh, two-part lead cloth seal so I'm not sure right you just see a circle around there so that's disc two 
So what you're looking at is disc one, interconnecting strip, um, and disc two on the back, and perhaps there's textile in the middle. And if it is, it'll be fustian. And I know that because this is a lead cloth sail from Augsburg in southern Germany. So that letter A there, that ornate A, with one, two, three, should be four little annulets and a little pellet in the middle, is stands for the city of Augsburg in southern Germany. And on the reverse is our pine cone device. So what you might make out there is um, a stylized pine cone, and it's within a beaded border, and, and between the two is um, a multi cusped circular frame and uh, this particular one has inward pointing trefoils with little terminals on the edge um, and, and I know that because I've researched these quite extensively in my thesis I know that these come from Augsburg in so southern Germany once attached to fustian cloth and the wonderful thing about this style of Augsburg cloth sale is that we can date it to right to the very end of the production of um, fustian cloth or the trade in fustian cloth should I say to both England and also to America. Um, archaeological excavations in um, at Martin's Hundred, uh, sorry Martin's Hundreds in Virginia have found almost identically the same cloth seals as this with these stylized pine cones um, and they've revealed a very narrow dating context of between 1620 and 1622. Um, I guess it would have been the Virginia Company who were dealing or trading with the East, East India Company um, shipping the goods from London all the way across to America so wonderful evidence of you know long distance trade so if these objects were made in Augsburg in southern Germany they'd have been shipped up the Rhine to um, either Amsterdam or probably Amsterdam then over the English Channel to London English traders would have been uh, based, typically East India Company traders based in London would ship this across the, the Atlantic to America but also up the northeast coast and in our case we know that because here we have one in Durham so fantastic evidence brings the total to over 310 315 lead cloth sales now they the cloth sales that are found in Durham constitute the largest collection of late and post medieval finds in the north of England so just imagine how important the lead cloth seals are right so fantastic um what the two objects which are key here are our little pectoral cross um decorated 12th century annual buckle there with a little beaded border oh sorry 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 um and what else perhaps our button our button there pewter button with a capital b on there so for me, those are the three star finds of today. Um, and we will get these uh, photographed, conserved, get them into the lab, get them recorded. Um, and hopefully we'll get some students to research them at the Department of Archaeology. And that one definitely will go into a museum on display. And I'm guessing that one, we can add that to a collection of buttons and, and that one deserves to be. So fingers crossed, we'll get at least one of the three into a museum actually actually the level of preservation of the Augsburg seal is such that that deserves to be in the Museum of Archaeology as well so fantastic finds um, I'm delighted and let's um, go and get them into the lab <laughs>